Welcome to the KFGS. My name is Bang Bok Lee, Deputy Director of the Public Diplomacy Department of the Korea Foundation. The topic for the first session is realities of the multicultural world, and simultaneous interpretation will be provided for this panel between Korean and English. It is my honor to introduce to you our moderator for the first pa panel, the president and co-founder of the Migration Policy Institute, Institute Dr. Dimitrios Papadimitriou. Dr. Papadimitriou has also been serving as the president of the Migration Policy Institute Europe in Brussels, while filling the role as the convener of the Transatlantic Council on Migration and Integration, the Regional Migration Study Group. He is also the co-founder of the International Chair, Emetrius of Metropolis, and he has, very, he has held various posts in succession, including the Chair of the World Economic Forum, Global Agenda Council on Migration, and the Chair of the Migration Committee of the OECD. So from now on, the microphone will be handed to Dr. Pap Papa Dimitrio. Would you please join me welcoming him with a big hand? Thank you very much. Now that we have established that uh, I'm an old person, otherwise I couldn't possibly have done all these things that uh, I'm accused of having done. Um, I wanted to talk to you about a couple, in a couple of minutes about sort of the choreography of this first panel. Um, you will have noticed from your program that I'm both a speaker and the moderator. Um, and I, as a result, I will go last. Um, you have at least two distinguished speakers in this um, panel. And why don't we start with um, uh, Professor Brenda Yeo from Singapore University. Now I am the University of Singapore. <clears throat> I suspect that you have all looked at the bio sketches of every speaker um, in this session and the rest of the sessions. And um, I am not going to spend uh, much time introducing uh, the speakers here, but um, Brenda is a friend and she's also a very distinguished migration scholar. Um, she's the dean at uh, the university, at Singapore University, has an extensive record of writing and publishing. Um, she convenes groups, attends conferences, um, chairs and presides over her own conferences and she's someone that everyone wants to have around the table in any serious conversation about migration in Asia. Uh, to my right is Christian Yapie, also a friend. Uh, he has again a distinguished publications record, he has taught, and he has uh, participated in meetings and colloquia, etc., cetera, et cetera, on both sides of the Atlantic. He says in two continents, I don't know what that means, but you know, everywhere I go, Christian has been there or he is about to be there. So it is a pleasure to um, have two um, friends on either side of me, and I think you will find that these are truly exceptional thinkers and speakers when it comes to the topic of today's event. Um, essentially what we'll try to do is keep to about 20 minutes per presentation, with Brenda going first, Christian second, then I will go third. That will give us about half an hour for a Q&A uh, for a conversation, perhaps, uh, among ourselves. And then uh, we are going to um, have a conversation with the rest of us, of you. You ask the questions, we attempt to answer your questions. There are no guarantees from this end that you will like the answers, but there are guarantees <laughs> that an attempt will be made to answer your questions. We're going to stop sharply at 11.50, I'm told, or I will have to be penalized and pay for my meals or something like that. 
Um, the reason is that some of the speakers will have to leave at 12 o'clock sharp in order to go on to another lecture. Uh, so, um, without um, saying much more than what I have to um, and what I have said so far, the one thing that I'm, I would be remiss if I didn't say two words about would be expressing my thanks and I believe the thanks of my colleagues here on the panel to the Korean Foundation, uh, the university, uh, the IOM training center, and whomever else contributed both in thinking through and putting together this event, but also in being responsible for taking such good care of us. Thank you very much on behalf of my colleagues. So Brenda, why don't you just take it over? Thank you. <coughs> we need a clicker here. You have it. You have a clicker. Might be a button at the base. Okay. Right. Right. Good. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure and a real honor to be here. And uh, I didn't know I was going first, but um, thank you for for that. So I mean, uh, and um, it's truly quite a humbling experience uh, listening to the opening address. There's, I think, so much that uh, Singapore can learn from Korea, even though um, we were supposed to be multicultural first. Uh, as you see, there, there are issues and, and, and problems as well, and I think uh, there is indeed uh, a lot of scope for the kinds of exchange that we're starting to have today. So the topic that I'm going to speak on is on migration and diversities, I mean, playing on the word diversities, challenges and possibilities in uh, Global City Singapore. This uh, is... Well, first of all, I, I think there are about four or five sections, and I'll try to spend just three or four minutes um, on, on each. The first is to introduce you to Singapore, its past and its future. Singapore is indeed a city-state uh, with very explicit kind of globalizing ambitions and orientations, uh, although its past is, of course, and its current present is also rooted in the conditions of colonial pluralism. In the 19th century, I mean, Singapore was, in a sense, um, so-called founded by the British as a trading emporium, and that's often associated in the, in the sort of prose of uh, colonial writers like Somerset Maugham as with a, a cosmopolitan kind of demography in terms of its street life, its culture, its landscape, uh, and that's largely because of a open door policy, a very liberal open door policy to immigration, uh, as well as the British pragmatic tolerance for plural societies. So you see here in that picture, uh, a, a picture, a typical picture of colonial Singapore, where diversity is also often uh, conflated with chaos, with uh, oriental uh, sort of quaintness, and a lack of discipline and order. So the British did quite a bit to try to sanitize and sort of bring order and discipline to this, this chaotic but very diverse uh, colonial city in, in the 19th and early 20th century. So moving forward then to the uh, 21st century, um, popular accounts um, that you see in tourist guidebooks and so forth continue to emphasize the city's demographic and cultural diversity uh, that's often made more complex by many more rounds of uh, transnational migration. This is not working, I need both. No? This one? Is this one better? Right, okay, so, right, okay, so, Right, so, and so as we move into the age of globalization, basically, I mean, you still see tourist guidebooks describing Singapore as sort of truly cosmopolitan with a fascinating mix of people and cultures and so forth. So its diversity is still very much part of the emphasis uh, today, of course, without the, the usual colonial idioms. Um, let me just describe a little bit the uh, foundations of uh, multiracialism in Singapore in the very immediate post-colonial nation-building phase when Singapore became independent uh, in the uh, late 60s and 1970s. Um, it became independent against the backdrop 
of a plural society with racialized categories that has been hardened by colonial policy. And uh, so colonialism, race was something that's uh, more or less taken for granted. People were divided and identified by races. So the new national leaders uh, and the political elites in Singapore had very little choice but to try to uh, weld together the heterogeneous lead peoples of Singapore uh, into one people on the basis of, of an ideology of multiracialism, uh, in fact, what's called separate but equal multiracialism. And uh, this kind of uh, nation building in the early years of Singapore's um, independence uh, gave emphasis to economic nationalism, so to build up the economy, as well as the management of race. Um, and this is um, the um, easiest way to remember Singapore's founding philosophy um, in terms of the four M's plus M, four M's being multiracialism, multiculturalism, multilingualism, and multireligiosity, plus the, the fifth M that glues it all together, meritocracy. So this is the kind of founding philosophy on which uh, Singapore as a nation of many races and but one people was built. Um, and you see this in sort of schools where children, uh, when they, they draw the national flag or national day, would uh, depict the four, the so-called four uh, founding races. Uh, you see here again um, the uh, various depictions of uh, multiracialism in terms of the four founding races, the, um, the Ch Chinese, Malay, Indian and other, or the so-called CMIO model, uh, as the stuff on which uh, Singapore is, is made. So you see in that one of the pictures there, is there a pointer on this? Uh, well, the, the little cartoon says, in terms of different languages, you could say uh, in, in Malay, saya, awak, kita, or in Chinese, war, ni, woman. Tamil, unfortunately, I can't pronounce, <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the glue is supposed to be, of course, English as a common language, I, you, and we. So that's um, a, a, a depiction of the multilingual society. And you see that in uh, other uh, formations as well, in terms of housing, in terms of defense, and so forth. Um, and uh, to sort of um, give a visual uh, depiction to multiracialism is uh, the former Prime Minister Goh Chok Tong's vision of building a multiracial nation through integration, where he depicts uh, Singapore, as he says, not in terms of mosaic pieces, but in terms of four overlapping circles, which each circle representing one community. And um, basically, it talks about how we are truly Singaporean uh, with minimal consciousness of our ethnicity in the areas of overlap. So uh, in a sense, uh, this kind of formation is what um, Singapore is envis envisioned to, to be like uh, in terms of the, the former prime minister's vision. Um, and um, this kind of uh, formulation of the multiracial nation, of course, has its exclusions as well. So it includes, but also ex excludes, CMIO formulations privilege fixed categories, which are tied to ancestral cultures, uh, Chinese, Malay, Indian in particular, and tends to ignore the more mobile others, the migrant others, present in the city who do not belong to the CMIO races, but um, that constitutes Singapore citizenry. So what happens to those who are not CMI? They, of course, lump together in other others, which is a rather un, un, um, unanalytical, it's an untidy category. So these others, these migrant others, are uh, non-residents. They can range from foreign workers uh, in construction, in domestic service, and other treaty jobs, to uh, foreign talent, as they are known in Singapore, the professional managerial elite um, that's also attracted to Singapore. These kinds of migrant mobile others are outside of state constructions of the national population and are in fact left out in any form of census taking. Um, so on, in that, on, based on that particular background, I just want to focus now on three themes uh, to try to highlight the way in which very rapid and highly diverse transnational migration has reconfigured the social and spatial fabric of uh, Singapore. And that is, uh, I want to speak about uh, demography in terms of how it relates to the multiracial nation, uh, identity issues uh, in terms of ambivalence around hyphenated identities. And thirdly, 
uh, landscapes uh, and how they relate to the different kinds of immigration in different classes. Very briefly on each one of them. So the first, to look at uh, changing demographies in, in Singapore. Um, there is, a, a, Singapore is a society that's also trying to run faster and faster like Korea. Uh, and uh, the Singapore government has geared its development plans to uh, cater to a population of 6.5 million. Um, and a while ago, 10 years ago, I think that, that sounds rather far-fetched. But uh, actually, it's not that far-fetched because the current population is already 5.3. Uh, million um, at, at the last count. Um, for this particular effort to win this uh, global race and to become 6.5 million, uh, Singapore cannot depend on, in this, on its indigenous citizenry uh, because our birth rates, our fertility rates are really very low. I think we, we can compete with Korea as to see who, who races to the bottom first. Uh, and um, in terms of uh, resident birth, um, the fertility rate is about 1.2, 1.1 uh, kind of rate, very similar to Korea's, and um, that produces a growth rate of only about 0.8%. So in order to uh, tr try to um, uh, increase population size, something else has to be brought into play. So fertility rates, for example, um, as depicted in this particular diagram, uh, that's broken up in terms of the races, Chinese, Indian, and Malay, uh, shows that um, even the Malay population, which is the, the, the green line, the M Malay population used to be the population that remains above replacement level, has dipped below. And um, there are blips and uh, sort of trials and so forth. That all depends on whether it's the year of the dragon or the year of the tiger or, or so forth in order to, and that has an influence on the fertility rate. Uh, for the Chinese in particular, but the trend is downwards, right? So, um, and um, going to be very difficult to recover. So, the stock indeed has not been doing its job in Singapore. And the population is uh, fast becoming uh, a little bit, will soon be like Japan where it doesn't replace itself. So, these are more figures. I won't go into the uh, details, but if you look at the column in red, uh, that's the growth of the non-resident population. So not the citizenry, but the non-resident population has been growing very rapidly. Uh, and uh, what, what I mean by the non-resident population, Singapore has a very aggressive uh, strategy of um, recruiting uh, foreign labour. And foreign labour enters Singapore in different channels, in different categories. Uh, I've just listed a non-exhaustive list there includes foreign talent, which are the skilled, uh, kind of highly skilled people who hold professional managerial levels, uh, foreign workers, the unskilled or low skilled in construction, manual work and so forth. Uh, workers in the mid-level skills has been expanding quite rapidly, technician, chefs, service workers, healthcare workers and so forth. Uh, we also have a strategy of recruiting international students, um, entrepreneurs, trainees, confinement nannies, uh, come, come to Singapore from Malaysia to look after uh, pregnant women, uh, sporting talent, uh, family migration, as well as uh, study mothers, uh, or paid umama, those who accompany their children to study in Singapore schools. So of which we have quite a number of Koreans in, in Singapore, uh, along with uh, the PRC Chinese. So this is the uh, grand summary of the population today. Uh, as you can see, citizens are only 3.29 million, and everybody else, um, the, the other 2 million would be based on the other permanent residents or non-residents. So in, in, in other words, I mean, uh, if Korea is, what, what is it, 2 point, 3 percent, 3 percent foreign, um, you, you do your sums, in, in Singapore, uh, of every five people you meet, two would be non-Singaporeans, non-citizens. Uh, that's how high the uh, immigration rate is. Um, I won't go through the different uh, races and foreign nationalities. I just also want to um, bring to attention something that's already a well-known phenomenon in Korea, uh, but it's increasing in Singapore, which is the, the rise of cross-nationality cross and inter-ethnic marriages that has uh, important bearing on the nation's multiracial complexion. Uh, and again, the statistics would probably um, compare uh, very well with, with, with Korea. In terms of cross-nationality marriages involving a citizen spouse 
and a foreign spouse, uh, that is 40% of marriages registered every year in Singapore. Uh, and in terms of inter-ethnic marriages, that will be 20%. So as you can see, that is uh, a phenomenon that is going to transform the fabric of society quite uh, drastically in the years to come. Let me now, now move on to the hyphenation of identities as my next theme. Um, every year or so, the uh, Institute of P Public Policy uh, basically um, does a survey of uh, Singaporeans asking questions like, do you prefer to identify yourself as Singaporean or Malay or Chinese or, or, or Indian? And uh, the statistics uh, have been uh, moving um, sort of in the direction of more, sing more Singaporeans identifying themselves as Singaporeans first, uh, as opposed to following CMIO prescriptions. So um, um, that's heartening for nation building and a sense of uh, being uh, one nation and one people. At the, at the same time, the state does promote the fact that uh, developing a national identity does not mean the erasure of ethnic markers. So, uh, and state policies support and accommodate CMIO ethnic identities. And in fact, many policies in Singapore, whether it's in housing, political representation, heritage issues and all that, are based very much on uh, uh, understanding of race uh, in the context of uh, multiracialism that tries to be even-handed. Um, as one journalist puts it, no one is required to adjure his or her race in order to be a Singaporean. So in that context, uh, we must understand that as society becomes even more diverse and less bounded, um, is that enough? Is uh, sort of, um, you know, being Singaporean but uh, continuing to maintain Chinese or Malay or, or Indian heritage, is that enough? Uh, or do we need more complex forms of identification? So the Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong in 2006 National Day Rally speech appealed to Singaporeans not just to welcome new immigrants, uh, and to recognize uh, difference. He even talked about how a Chinese Chinese is different from a Singapore Chinese, and Indian Indian is different from a Singapore Indian. And he actually in that speech proposed uh, allowing for hyphenated uh, national racial identities for at least the first few generations. To quote him, he says, we will hyphenate Australian Singaporean, Chinese Singaporean, Chinese Chinese Singaporeans, but make them one of us and if we meet one of them, let's be friendly, let's go out of the way to show them around, help them, make them feel at home. So even if the first generation is not completely Singaporean, the second generation growing up here will be and will contribute to Singapore. So he goes on to talk about how hopefully the hyphen will dissolve after a couple of generations. Uh, so and that bore fruit uh, last year in 2010 in terms of a policy innovation in Singapore, which is to allow the children of mixed marriages to choose between adopting the race of either the father or mother, they used to, to adopt the father's race, and also to use double barrel race classifications in official documents. So in announcing this change, the Prime Minister uh, based the rationale uh, partly on the number of inter, uh, international marriages happening across racial lines. He, he talks about how, um, you know, I mean, we should let parents decide whether the kids will be uh, Chinese kid, Indian kid, maybe European, maybe Japanese, maybe Vietnamese. Um, the, there will be many Singaporeans who have married Vietnamese spouses, for example. We think it's best to leave the parents to decide on identity issues. Uh, uh, but uh, I do have to add that the policy change um, does require identification with a dominant race, and that race has still be, to be put before the hyphen. So, and that's what's used in all administrative purposes like deciding on uh, public housing quotas or, or, or representation in politics and so forth. So in, again, in the PM's words, uh, the move towards hyphenation is a form of liberalization of identity politics, but not a revolution. Uh, it gives you more choice to, de to decide how you want to identify yourself, but does not impact entrench policy. right? Um, and um, so far, this, this is just 2010, so so far, the unofficial polls uh, show that uh, mixed-race Singaporeans do not really feel the need to uh, hyphenate, and, um, but about 16% uh, so far of uh, mixed heritage babies have double-barreled races in the official documents uh, in the last uh, six, well, in a year and a half. 
So um, the question then is hyphenation um, um, is um, it has to be it has to also to be remembered that hyphenation is not a means to accommodate foreign others transiting to becoming part of national self because it does not apply to foreign workers um, because most of these would be in a non-resident category uh, they're not permitted to settle in Singapore so this question of hyphenation is something that doesn't include uh, um, those who are not um, within the fold of um, citizenry. So the, the legitimization of hyphenated identities, of course, is still uh, important as a way of liberalizing identity politics, but it does not, uh, in my opinion, uh, widen the base for claims making to gain cultural rights on the part of foreign others. Uh, it does, of course, help to um, create a more flexible ways of thinking around race cultivating, hopefully, cosmopolitan sensibilities and accommodating difference. But it, it is limited to the realm of identity politics, I feel. Moving quickly then to uh, my last theme, which is to do with the transformation of the everyday landscape in Singapore with, uh, um, you know, I mean, 40% um, of the population non-citizen, what happens? Basically, uh, there is, uh, in uh, my colleague Daniel Goh's words, a new pluralism is noticeable. It reflects the complexities of race, class, nationality, and residency. And uh, this is uh, very much part of the new globalized economy. He talks about how here in Singapore, whilst the largely Chinese professional class competes with hastily naturalized immigrant Chinese and Indian professionals, the hobnob with white expatriates uh, possessing privileged residency status. Uh, these groups are then serviced by working class, uh, Chinese, Indian, Malay, Singaporeans in different economic sectors and everyone lives in spaces built and maintained by Indian, Indonesian, and Filipino immigrant workers with minimal le legal protection. So in one sort of sentence, he's trying to build in the cultural complexity and pl plurality of Singapore um, that underlies Singapore. Um, one important phenomenon that's appeared uh, in the Singapore landscape is, of course, the weekend enclaves. The unskilled and low-skilled migrant workers are admitted to, into Singapore on short-term work permits. They are disposable labour without residency rights, so they tend to be uh, more prominently uh, um, visible in the landscape in terms of weekend enclaves. Um, in the, during the work week, they are either in dormitories, as you see at the bottom row there, or at home, uh, if they are domestic workers. It's on the Sundays when uh, some of them have a day off, that uh, they would, uh, in a sense, uh, create uh, scenarios like these. This is, South, this is Little India, where South Asian foreign workers uh, congregate. Um, as this is um, in terms of Filipino domestic workers on a day off in uh, Orchard Road, basically. I mean, um, of course, Singapore likes signs like no sitting, no picnicking allowed, but of course, um, who cares? So, yeah. Uh, so, what's the place of the foreign worker in the city state? Uh, weekend on clays, foreign worker gatherings uh, tend to be viewed negatively um, by Singaporeans. So still s uh, lots of work to be done there. Uh, seeing many, many Singaporeans still consider these to be intrusions into their own backyard and um, often asking the authorities to step up security measures. Um, in a Little India, the residents of the public housing there has put up steel barricades around their blocks to keep the foreign workers out. And you see signs like these, which are targeted largely at foreign workers as uh, no littering, that's quite common, no sleeping, no eating, and no urinating, I think. Yeah, so uh, I, I brought my students out on a field trip to Little India recently, and we actually witnessed a group of um, um, auxiliary police uh, surrounding a, a foreign worker uh, questioning him because they saw a secret butt next to him. So, well, um, but um, as you can see, I mean, uh, they, they would, uh, um, well, I, I think I better get, get on or not finish. So, okay, so then moving quickly then to um, the other end of the spectrum, the expatriate landscapes, uh, where uh, professional managerial migrants uh, have, have made their mark. Uh, in terms of residential enclaves, which are sometimes nationality-based. This has, of course, also have a gentrifying effect on the landscape in terms of uh, um, boosting property prices and rental yields, as well as transforming neighborhoods from the old school shops selling groceries and joysticks to uh, fresco eateries, upmarket specialist shops, and so forth. 
in order to try to uh, attract a more diverse globe trotting clientele. Um, so you see here, you know, Serangoon's French invasion. Serangoon Gardens is a is a estate in Singapore, and um, well, um, this Holland Village and so forth. Uh, and this one, I've always want, wanted to know why in Singapore we suddenly started celebrating Halloween. I mean, that's something that we don't usually. I mean, uh, uh, but now you see in Singapore sort of um, estates uh, being sort of. Um, pedestrianized and, and cordon off a little bit I mean, in order to celebrate these uh, festivals which um, in some ways are uh, not something that we saw uh, say 10, 20 years ago. Um, okay, so I will be very brief on the tensions uh, between Singaporeans and foreigners. Um, this has certainly uh, been given the very large uh, percentage of foreigners in, in our midst Basically, um, there's been lots of issues with the Singaporeans. Um, many complaining that their foreign talents take away their jobs, are paid too much, enjoy all the privileges in, and none of the responsibilities that citizens bear, including national service. Uh, and uh, some of the friction here is also based on so-called cultural differences between the new immigrants and locals. Uh, one very uh, recent controversy has to do with curry, with food. Food is, of course, central to Singaporeans' um, uh, consciousness, and uh, this was known as a, the, the curry incident. When um, what what happened was a Singaporean Indian family, uh, after uh, was asked to stop cooking curry when the immigrant Chinese neighbors were at home because the Chinese neighbors couldn't stand the smell of curry, and so. <laughs> That basically created quite a, a lot of ruckus uh, on social media, and uh, to the extent that uh, the Singaporeans of all races was so annoyed by this that uh, a group of them got together to 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 uh, uh, a cook a curry campaign. So everyone is supposed to cook curry uh, on that day uh, in order just to annoy the uh, immigrant um, others who may not like curry. So it's incidences like these which uh, become. Um, publicized on, on social media and that gives some some clue as to what kinds of tensions exist between Singaporeans and foreigners. I'm going to conclude because I'm sure I'm out of time. So just in conclusion, uh, in terms of uh, diversity Singapore, uh, in terms of demography, contemporary migration has been a very compelling force in increasing population diversity, um, particularly with mixed marriages, that kind of diversity is something that is planted in the very DNA of future generations, so that's something that's, uh, I think, inexorable uh, and needs to be taken into account. In terms of identity and identity politics, um, I think CMIO kind of multiracialism, that kind of template will be forced to change in the face of diverse immigration flows because people just don't fall within sort of straight jackets of uh, CMIO, and that might encourage um, identity politics of difference, which will then require much more flexible management of race while still capitalizing on the strength of an already plural society that Singapore has. And finally, in terms of the landscape, um, there are distinct processes of enclosure and enclavement ar uh, around kind of self-other divides that are happening. And this kind of um, phenomena does mean that um, there's also a need to encourage uh, selective acculturation, negotiation of coexistence with people with different histories and geographies as they meet each other in the context zone of diversity Singapore. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brenda, for this very clear and uh, thoughtful presentation. What I propose is that I will make some comments summarizing the presentations um, after I speak. So why don't we have Christian go next? Great pleasure to be here. Um, 
I will um, talk more about the Western European experience, which is one, as I suggest, after multiculturalism, I do apologize for this contretemps, which is a bit uh, offensive maybe to our <laughs> Korean hosts here who are discovering the glories uh, of the MC thing. Uh, the Europeans um, are at a rather different stage in, in that uh, respect. Um, so my topic is immigrant integration after multiculturalism. Um, the conventional wisdom here is um, that there are distinct national models uh, in, in Europe to deal with uh, immigrants uh, and their integration. Say, Britain is multicultural, France is assimilationist, uh, Germany is um, segregationist uh, or refuses to integrate. Uh, so is the common national model uh, wisdom, which I find misleading. It is misleading because, uh, in my view, there is a convergence of policy on some essential parameters. And um, in particular, there is convergence on two types of policy. On the one side, civic integration, about which I will talk a little bit more in a few uh, seconds. Uh, and on the other side, there is anti-discrimination. Somehow, this duplet, uh, civic integration policy and anti-discrimination policy, is, um, is the convergent trend in Europe. And both uh, of these two policies, they follow different logics, uh, uh, different philosophies. Um, in civic integration, the burden of uh, adjustment is all on the newcomer on the immigrant proper. He or she has to change more than the receiving society. In anti-discrimination, which is now uh, a European law even, and member states are required to, uh, to implement uh, anti-discrimination uh, directives that come from Brussels, here <clears throat> the philosophy is different. Here the burden of adjustment is not really on the immigrant, but on the receiving society, which discriminates and better stop doing it. Um, this actually shows, I can only flag that very briefly without going into it in more detail, that the official logo in Europe and in the West at large, that integration is a two-way process in which both sides simultaneously have to change uh, both the immigrant and the receiving society. This is a deceptive logo um, because what you find in reality is two one-way processes, uh, uh, one in which only the migrant has to change, that is the civic integration thing, and uh, the other one-way process is the anti-discrimination policy where basically only the receiving society is asked uh, to change. Now, um, that to me is the most important policy convergence in Europe with respect to civic integration and uh, anti-discrimination. Another interesting conversion, more from the, <coughs> call it the, every, the daily newspapers, recently three European state leaders declared uh, that multiculturalism is dead. That is uh, Europe's goodbye to multiculturalism. Um, uh, Chancellor Merkel in uh, Germany did it. She called multiculturalism an utter failure. Uh, French, then French President Sarkozy uh, did it. Uh, um, he, he said that there has been so much talk about their identity, that is the migrants, now it's time to talk about our identity, the French, which is a bizarre statement if one follows the identity obsession of the French uh, in the face of Islam in the past two decades. And finally, least, uh, not, uh, not least, uh, David Cameron, the Prime Minister of uh, England, declared the end of what he called state multiculturalism and he pleaded for what he called muscular liberalism. Now, each of these death sayings of multiculturalism responds to a particular situation, a particular domestic uh, uh, situation. Merkel, of course, 
had to respond to an immensely popular anti-Islam book by a major member of the Social Democratic Party and former board member of the Deutsche Bank who actually had to resign after that outrageous piece of writing, um, which is a fierce critique of Germany's uh, immigration policy, a very uh, realistic assessment of the immigration reality in that country. Unfortunately, the book is uh, also uh, having a few stupid uh, passages on that the IQ level of Turks or Muslims is lower than that of uh, ordinary Germans and because they have more children, Deutschland schafft sich ab, Germany is abolishing itself, both in terms of <laughs> intelligence and in terms of uh, uh, demography. That is of course stupid reasoning. Uh, it destroys, uh, in many respects, a very interesting book. And Merkel had to respond to that. That book was immensely popular, even though the political elites say you cannot talk that kind of uh, drastic talk. And uh, uh, Merkel somehow had to win uh, opinions and uh, 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 votes in the right quarter uh, um, um, with her uh, declaration that uh, multiculturalism is an utter failure. At the same time, Merkel announced the creation of uh, Islam Lehrstühle, that is uh, Islam instruction at uh, German universities at public federal expense, uh, which is an interesting uh, dissonance that shows that there is no real end of uh, integrating the Islam in Germany, no real end of de facto multiculturalism, uh, because this uh, Islam integration is, of course, going on as, as before and rather successfully, if you ask me. Now there are other um, uh, domestic situations that forced Sarkozy to give his statement, that caused Cameron to give his statement. Uh, you can consult my paper for it. Uh, I will uh, jump over these passages here. There is, of course, an interesting commonality of all of these three anti-multicultural interventions. Islam and problems of Muslim integration are key and central to all of them. And I will get back to the Islam issue in, uh, uh, in a second. Um, first, I want to address kind of the uh, uh, second last point here on that uh, slide. In general, there are mainly two critical issues. Uh, with respect to cultural uh, integration, with respect to the cultural integration of immigrants. If you really think it through, in the end there are only two issues, language and religion. I submit there is a third critical marker, race, but I do think this is prominent only in America. Uh, it is almost absent as a, as a, as a cultural integration issue in, 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 in Europe. So language and religion. There has been a remarkable little uh, think piece by one of my intellectual heroes, who is Ari Solberg um, uh, from the New School. He wrote a brilliant uh, article together with one of his students in which he argued uh, that Spanish is to the United States what Islam is to Europe, namely the main cultural integration issue on both sides of the Atlantic. There is no problem, interestingly, with uh, Islam and Muslim integration in the, in the United States, which, which would ask for another uh, very detailed investigation that I cannot deliver here. I only want to make a more conceptual point of how language and religion differ um, with respect to cultural integration. They pose, they pose different problems. If indeed it is the case that Spanish is to the US what Islam is to Europe, then I have to conclude the US has a much smaller cultural integration problem than Europe. Why? Because language, the nature of language is to be additive. It is capacity enhancing. Every individual, every school child in Europe, in primary school it starts, is expected to pick up English, to pick up a second language. And of course, you're not then asked to forget your original, your mother language. That is an absurdity. One can speak more than one language. One is even expected, uh, as an educated person, uh, to acquire more than one language in school. Religion is completely different. Religion is exclusive. 
you can adhere to only one religion. You can, of course, convert, but then you are asked to give up your first religion. At least that is the practice in the, in the, in the classic uh, Abrahamite uh, monotheisms, uh, Judaism, uh, Christianity, is Islam. Um, this now, if, if this description is true, that language goes with, le with several languages, but religion only goes by one religion, then this has implications for state policy. Because states, with respect to language, have to be de facto assimilationist. A state must have an official language, not written into the Constitution, but by way of practice. Otherwise, you, there is no rule, <laughs> no business of rule possible if you cannot communicate uh, in, one, in one medium. Conversely, states have to be de facto multicultural on religion because religion cannot be forced. It has to be respected, particularly in a liberal constitutional state where freedom of religion is the Grundrecht at all. Uh, uh, Jelinek, the German uh, uh, jurist, wrote a great uh, 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 little article about uh, how the, the right for religious freedom is actually the basic human right in, in, in Western uh, history. Now, uh, interestingly, such respect for religion, which the liberal constitutional state uh, has to uh, deliver, you don't need a multiculturalism policy for it because you have uh, provisions in state constitutions that guarantee uh, individual uh, religious rights, which usually also includes rights for practicing religion in, in group uh, or in, as, as a collectivity. So why now is Islam a problem in Europe? I still have a few minutes, Dimitri. Huh? Four points, and I have to be very short on that. I do not think this is a structural uh, privileging of Christianity. Uh, somehow American observers, if they write about Europe, they say, we Americans have the perfect uh, separation between state and religion, but you Europeans, somehow you still have Christian states, you didn't manage to separate cleanly, clearly and cleanly from uh, Christian religion. I find that is a rather um, wrong um, uh, assessment. I just wrote a book uh, called Legal Integration uh, of Islam together with an American colleague, John Torpy, and one of our punchlines is actually that with respect to institutionally accommodating Islam, Western Europe has done a job as good as North uh, America. A second uh, uh, possibility, a much more realistic candidate of why Islam is a problem in Europe, Islam simply is the protest ideology of a socio-economically marginalized second and third generation of, uh, of, of Muslim people. Um, <laughs> 30 years ago, the, the main protest ideology was Marxism-Leninism. And uh, that, for various reasons, is no longer an, an offer to offer a batch of identity for uh, excluded people. Now it is Islam. Actually, this is not my invention. This sort of reasoning, uh, the French Islam specialist Olivier Roy has written interesting uh, uh, work in, in this respect. A third uh, candidate here, why <coughs> Islam is, is, is a problem in, in, in Europe. It is available um, as a protest ideology because of geopolitics. As a counterfactual, if, if, uh, if European societies would do a perfect job of integrating Muslims, there still would be Israel, there still would be Iraq, there still would be uh, Afghanistan uh, available, and there still would be a globally operating uh, Islamic uh, 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 a movement or a globally operating uh, political Islam, and as long as that is the case, uh, um, you will have, uh, yeah, uh, thinking uh, in, in these terms. And fourth, and I only very briefly flag that issue here, um, I do think 
there are inherent features in Islam. Um, I know I will be immediately attacked of being an Orientalist, of being a, a Islamophobe. I have heard these things too many times. Uh, there is an inherent feature of Islam which makes it a hard nut to crack in secular uh, liberal societies. The British anthropologist, uh, uh, cum philosopher Ernest Gellner, he wrote a great book on uh, Islam societies and he argued already 40 years ago that um, Islam as a religion is particularly secularization resistant uh, and I do think that is uh, altogether a fair characterization. It is a religion of law that does not easily allow the compartmentalization of life. It prescribes a unity of belief and ritual, of private and political practices, which is an irritation to liberalism. Liberalism, by contrast, Michael Walzer called it very evocatively the art of separations, and Islam somehow has difficulties with that uh, approach. But this is provocative. If you already express these things, you are in the quarter of the Islamophobes because uh, that is uh, PC, uh, uh, kind of not according to political correctness to talk that way. Okay. Now, uh, to sum this up, these four points, there is a general suspicion in Europe that Islam's integration is only tactical. It's not intrinsic. Uh, and that actually has triggered in response the very virulent uh, doctrine of muscular liberalism of uh, David Cameron and others, which I do think is a bigger threat to liberalism than uh, the Islamic uh, uh, culprit uh, in that imagination. But I cannot uh, really go into it because my time is running out. And I come to civic integration, which is uh, the kind of the mainline post-multicultural integration policy that uh, Europe uh, has these days. Dimitri, how many minutes do I have left? Are you kidding? All right. You see, you always go uh, too long. I thought I would not uh, uh, have a problem here, but I do have a problem. Civic integration. Uh, well, you read my paper, what it is. Look, multiculturalism as an ideology says, diversity is fine, respected, supported by means of state policy. And I think the Europeans have received, uh, they have entered a, a stage in, in, in that process. Multicultural, our societies are anyway. What state policy has to do is provide a center. Because multiculturalism is a world in which everything and everyone seems to flee the center. So, the task of state policy cannot be to reinforce that process. I know Will Kimlicka would uh, disagree. Um, the task of state policy, by contrast, is to, to be kind of uh, uh, antipodic to this, uh, to, to be counterbalancing this uh, central fugal tendency of multicultural societies. And I do think civic integration is, uh, is that one policy that tries to do it. It emphasizes language, 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 because with speak, without speaking the language of the place uh, in which you immigrated into, you cannot get jobs, you cannot uh, succeed, you cannot, uh, 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 as it were, as it were um, uh, prevail. And secondly, there's an interesting civic uh, education component to civic uh, uh, integration, uh, which has become admittedly stronger over the years and particularly in the confrontation with Islam, is, uh, Muslims are suspected of being illiberal, not uh, kind of partaking in the liberal uh, rules uh, of the game of, uh, of, of, of Western European societies, and therefore there's the emphasis to, 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 to make them uh, understand at least what uh, a constitutional state is, what uh, uh, liberal democracy requires, what it consists of, uh, etc. What can we do? Um, what is to be done? And that is my last Well, this conclusion is obvious. What should be done in my last two minutes, Dimitri? <laughs> First, fight anti-discrimination more effectively. 
very interestingly, if Europe says goodbye to multiculturalism, that does not mean it says goodbye to state efforts to um, counteract discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, religion, uh, you name it. I know, people like Will Kimlicker would say multiculturalism and anti-discrimination, that's the same thing, it's the same package. I would say these are two very different policies. Multiculturalism seeks to reinforce diversity, to perpetuate diversity, difference. Anti-discrimination has the opposite thrust to abolish difference. Its thrust is to de-racialize society. This is how Ronald Dworkin has described the, lo the, the, the logic of affirmative action in the United States, which is, of course, the most uh, extreme example of uh, anti-discrimination. And the Europeans, as they withdraw from multiculturalism, strengthen, in turn, their effort to, uh, to institute uh, uh, anti-discriminatory laws and, and policies. Secondly, respect majority culture. That's the usual riposte against multiculturalism. Only they have an identity, as Sarkozy said it quite incorrectly, of course. Some of the majority is not part of it. It's supposed to be not having a culture. There's supposed to be not any emphasis in kind of protecting the ways of the majority. And that is wrong, because that feeds the resentment on the right fringe. If you have so many protest parties, uh, populist right-wing protest parties in almost any Western European country today, because the political elite has retreated from addressing the cultural concerns of the majority, that say, indeed, European is a Christian land, it's not another religion land, it's not a Muslim land, historically speaking. And there's an interesting court rule by the European Court of Human Rights, which is the highest uh, human rights court in Europe, which allows the Italian state to put crucifixes on its public school walls. To me, that is a right decision. It is the right decision. I know all liberals have rejected this uh, uh, decision as being uh, violating state neutrality, state uh, uh, secularism, etc. It's the right uh, approach, and it goes very interestingly together with robust uh, uh, pluralism, but I cannot uh, detail that uh, interesting uh, synchrony here. Select the right immigrants, the third principle. If the Canadians will tell you, if Will Kimlicka will tell you tomorrow, there's actually no conflict between civic integration and multiculturalism. It's part of the same package. In Canada, indeed. But why? Because Canada gets the immigrants it wants. It cherry picks the best and brightest of the international migrant stream according to their favorite point system. And then, of course, to, to throw sticks at immigrants once you selected them, once you welcome them, is a, is a perversity. Europe has immigrants it does not want. It has predominantly uh, asylum-seeking immigrants. It has predominantly family-forming, family-reunifying immigrants with debatable skill levels and deb debatable profiles uh, to be adjustable to liberal societies. Okay, so select the right immigrants, then you will get civic integration policies that may not be as nasty as they are right now in Europe. Don't repress robust debate. I'm an example of that and will not talk more. <laughs> Recognize the limits of policy. That's my last word. The Europeans think, oh, we need an integration policy. Rubbish. An integration policy is symbolic politics. If you look at the budget of uh, integration policy, it's still money I would like to have as an individual, but collectively speaking, it's insignificant if you compare it to the budget for military expenses, for road building, uh, etc. What is more important is institutions, labor markets, and educational systems. They matter. Non-specific uh, immigrant policies, kind of non-immigrant speci specific policies are important. Flexibilize labor markets. Make sure that uh, the sons of immigrants get uh, jobs and do not predominantly are unemployed. Spain has youth unemployment of some 50%. And of course, then immigrants, by implication, not because Spain is racist, suffer even more. You have to do uh, uh, reform of uh, labor law. You have to do reform of educational system because, for example, the stratified school systems of the Germanic type, which are only four... Uh, I, I stopped. <laughs> I 
I, <laughs> I had to stop him because he was getting <laughs> a bit too excited. So I didn't want him to have a, too much fun up here. Now, is Will here? I don't see him on this side. Now, the fact that he kept referring to Will reminds me of the Republican Convention in the United States where one important, perhaps, actor um, of the American cinema had a conversation with a chair. <laughs> I don't know if any of you actually saw that. It was Clint Eastwood, and it was an empty chair, and presumably on that chair was an empty suit. Presumably that was President Obama. So he had a monologue. So we'll wait until Will comes back, and uh, we'll see what it is. Unless Will is somewhere over there, and I can't see. Oh, you are. <laughs> OK, good. So um, the advantage of, um, of going after Christian is that um, I will actually sound very reasonable. <laughs> very non-controversial, <laughs> very plain, you know, relative to, um, to what it is that you heard from um, Christian. And of course, the objective here, I think we will all agree, is not to make each other, feel, each other feel good, but rather to have a robust debate. And in a robust debate, we do have to challenge each other and even uh, to the point where perhaps uh, being a bit um, uh, impolite, you know, at least in some cultures, this may be seen as impoliteness. You know, in the beginning of this session, we heard our hosts uh, sing paeans to multiculturalism. Um, and it means so many different things to so many different people and it sounds so odd to some people, and so, da, you know, what don't you get about it? So simple to so many others. But in order to start with a controversial point, perhaps, and not disappoint those people who expect me to say something controversial, um, you may miss the point as to how you actually build a diverse society. This idea that it is about accommodation that we heard may miss the point because the real point may very well be about how to build community, how to live together, not to how to accommodate newcomers or how to impose one's um, sort of majority culture etc., etc., on somebody else. And I know that Korea is committed to multiculturalism, uh, but I would hope that we're going to have a conversation over the next three days, you know, as to whether this is really a doable proposition, multiculturalism, particularly since Ms. Lee already acknowledged in her remarks that the reaction of the Korean public has actually worsened over the years, which to my mind, and I, you may think that I am you know, sort of like a young man who doesn't have a lot of experience, but I do have about 40 years of experience in this field. And what I will talk to you about and discuss during the next three days is in a sense more what that experience has taught me about the issues that we're discussing, rather than whether multiculturalism is good, bad, or indifferent, whether ethnic diversity is a good, a philosophy, rather than simply a fact of life that you have to contend with and manage, and all of the other things that I suspect my colleagues, be they political philosophers, political scientists, sociologists, Etc., cetera, etc., cetera, what their favorite pet theories may be versus to how you think about these issues from the perspective of a policymaker. And I try to think much more like a policymaker because too much of my life is engaged in trying to answer questions for policymakers 
who are also most frequently politicians. You can imagine it's not exactly a good position to be in. So let me uh, say a few words about context, because you can't have a conversation about any of these issues unless you understand the context. And right up front, I will acknowledge that I probably do not understand the Korean context, probably not much. Uh, I'm willing to learn. I can learn, <laughs> despite <laughs> all these years in this business. Uh, but um, context is king. And if I were to leave you with sort of one uh, sort of short phrase, is that context is king. But most of the things that I will say is, are things that are reflections uh, that uh, take into account a lot of the works of many of the people who are both um, uh, speakers, what do we call ourselves, faculty, is that what it is? Who are both faculty and also fellows who have written extensively about these topics. I try not to take sides. Um, and, um, but you will see that some of my reflections do seem to lean one way or another, sometimes the opposite way uh, as I go forward. And um, to be fair, my reflections will tend to be most relevant for North America um, and, um, and Europe, uh, including the eastern parts of Europe and a bit beyond that. So you could say that this is a Eurocentric look and, and, and a set of, um, of s statements and observations. And I do have to sort of um, wrap my mind around some of the things that Brenda said uh, because they simply sound so foreign to me and some of the things that we've heard so far and we'll be hearing more of from our Korean colleagues. So what is happening in the rest of the world? In other words, rather than East Asia. The rest of the world has a rather serious economic problem. It's in an economic crisis. Sort of the last thing that the rest of the world is thinking about at this time, unlike our Korean colleagues, is how to accommodate, how to bring more immigrants and how to accommodate them. Now, there are exceptions to this. Um, Australia, that did not get hurt by the crisis in 2008 and has so much you know, natural resources that probably can last them another five or 10 years, or 50, um, didn't get hurt. So they haven't really stopped, you know, um, um, uh, their immigration to any significant degree. They took a dip for a year or two back to 08, 09. Uh, but Australia has been always uh, one of the smartest players in immigration in the sense that they constantly adapt throw away that what doesn't work, try and experiment with new things, throw away and adapt those that do seem to work a little bit. And as a, res a result, they're trying to stay uh, on top of issues of immigrant selection, if not necessarily on issues of immigrant integration. And we have here uh, the relevant assistant secretary who will tell us how successful they are in terms of integration, which is I use as a neutral, in my book, the most neutral way of speaking about these issues. You know, it is the least loaded, although some people find it particularly loaded, but in the way I use it is the, lo the, most, the least loaded expression. Integration, which is about how do we live together. It's putting all of the pieces of a community together. So this economic crisis is forcing a reconsideration of an awful lot of things in most of the advanced industrial societies, one of which, of course, has been immigration. And it is quite remarkable and at extreme variance with where Australia, Canada, South Korea, Singapore are, at extreme variance with them that most of the other rich countries have 
gotten to a point over the last three or four or five years where net immigration has been at or near zero. And this is an important sort of contextual factor to take into account. You know, the United States falls somewhere in the middle of this. Europe is at, at about that net zero. Another contextual factor is that all of these countries, and I suspect including the countries that I said were exceptions to the rule, are really trying to come to terms with the remarkable transformations that the last five or six years have really wrought upon all of us. Among them is how fast economic circumstances have changed on the ground, how fast skills degrade, which put into an extraordinary um, they shed an extraordinarily bright light, light on our institutions for educating, educating and training people, our own people, as well as selecting immigrants that will help our countries move forward. We see power shifts, political power shifts and economic power shifts with a pronounced tendency toward Asia, but not exclusively toward Asia. And I think most tellingly, and in the long term most importantly, we're seeing sets of circumstances that will bring to fore the following question. Can the societies that I'm referring to maintain the social model that took them to where they now are? A social welfare model, that protects people from the time that they are born to the time that they are dead, that gives them an opportunity to live good lives long after they have stopped working. And if they do, who is going to pay for it? And I think this is going to be the biggest challenge because it is precisely that social model that has created the welfare states, particularly of Europe, but also of North America that has created a set of expectations that may, in fact, not be able to be met by the countries in the next generation. But we're here to discuss migration, so let me say a few things about migration. One of the things that has also happened in the last five years and continues to happen is that in too many instances, large-scale immigration into the advanced industrial world, give you an example, in the last 20 or so years, on a per capita basis, migration to the, o to the wealthy OECD countries has more than doubled, has more than doubled. Why is this meaningful? Because one, has to ask the question as to whether the rates of growth that have doubled the number of newcomers in societies, however societies define themselves, even if you define themselves in a very fluid way in which the Australians, the Canadians, or perhaps the Americans do, whether that rate of growth is something that is manageable without smart and I repeat, smart policies on the part of government without the cooperation and thoughtful activism of the non-governmental sector and without money. And I can count on the cooperation and activism of the NGO sector, civil society, whatever it is that, that you call it here, uh, I am less confident about smart governmental policies, and I have zero confidence about the ability to pay for the things that need to be done, which of course takes, brings me to a point of, um, let's say, skepticism or concern about how we're going to basically handle the future. All of those things 
in the past many years have created uh, several types of anxiety in many of the countries that I am discussing. And I have identified here in my paper, and I will just, you know, sort of go back to it, five such types of anxiety. The first one, if I can read, let's see if I can read the titles of this darn thing. Oh, well. Um, the first one is a concern about culture and, su and a sense of a loss of identity. And by that I mean that an awful lot of people, by no means the majority, but certainly people who are in their own way activists, noisemakers, people who speak on behalf of many more people than we sometimes recognize, are feeling that there has been a weakening of the norms and values that they hold dear, that somehow something has changed and that something is changing the way that the nation is identifying itself and they don't agree with that. They have a great deal of discomfort with that and that raises the issue of how do you really manage this? How do you handle this? And I will address or respond to some of these things later on in my, in my lecture. The second one I alluded to is a concern about the rapid pace of social change. As we all know from our own experiences, not because somehow analysts or academics or whatever or researchers told us about it, it is the rate of change, how fast things are changing that matters more than the magnitude of change. You can have enormous magnitude in change over a long period of time and be able to manage it. You can have considerable change over a short period of time and you can have problems with that. And what has happened in many countries over the last 20 years is that change has been, in a sense, happening literally in front of people's eyes. They see communities change almost from day to day. They see familiar things stop being familiar. They see languages spoken. The curry example that, you know, this used to be an example of about 30 years ago, you know, in, in New York and Washington and other places, you know, where people live in apartments. And curry seems to always be <laughs> the issue. But um, uh, all of these things um, have really created a sense of unfamiliarity with one's own environment, which very often simply uh, fuels that anxiety. Also, the location choices of new immigration also matters. To give you an example from the United States or from Germany, take Frankfurt or take New York or take Chicago, vast immigrant receiving cities. It really doesn't make much of a difference if the proportion in New York of the foreign born is 40 or 43 or 47 percent or 35 percent. This is a city and a government and a set of social institutions and political leadership that knows how to handle change, how to, to handle diversity. They live with, with it every day. So you don't see in these big places gigantic arguments about the new kinds of migration or how many new immigrants actually are coming in. Moreover, when you have percentages of immigrants that are that high, politically, it would be suicidal to set yourself against those ethnic communities because ultimately, at least in my part of the world, what well, politicians want to do more than anything else is be reelected. And since that is an imperative, I suspect you get to a point where simply the ethnic vote becomes too important for you to start acting weirdly when it comes to immigration. On the other hand, take smaller places throughout Germany, particularly Eastern Germany, and in other smaller places throughout Europe. Take places in the United States, 
in about 20 or so states that really hadn't seen much immigration since the 1930s. And by the mid-1990s, they started to see very significant new kinds of immigration. And the, the, the reaction to it, the anxiety, is totally predictable. They have not created the institutions. They have not learned how to deal with change. And as a result, the reaction tends to be um, um, unacceptably, perhaps, but nonetheless, tends to be um, a, a, an anti immigrant or can be seen as anti-immigrant reaction. The third one I call economics and inequality. And here is one of the most difficult aspects of migration as far as I am concerned because it requires a basic alchemy. And the last time that, uh, you know, alchemy became sort of a pseudoscience but nonetheless, and nonetheless an important pseudoscience back in the 15th and 16th century when they were trying to create gold, et cetera, et cetera, it didn't work, it doesn't work now. And that basic alchemy asks people to convert immigrants into economic assets rather than the liabilities that many people see them as. And by liabilities, I mean people who draw out from social uh, social uh, uh, expenditures, you know, people who sometimes tend to be dependent populations, et cetera, et cetera. That economic and to a certain degree social reaction into immigration is extremely important in many states, including many countries, including my own, where there is a sense that when you fight for limited resources, and you can identify a group that seeks or costs, if you will, m a disproportionate amount of these resources, you basically have the opportunity for a political argument and for building uh, further anxiety. The fourth one has to do with uh, politics, and particularly the sense that governments have lost control over the issue. If there is one thing that's very difficult to, pro to, to, to really, you know, um, change is an impression on the part of an electorate, of a citizenry, that you have lost control over immigration. And there are many ways of losing control over immigration. In some countries, the argument is about borders. In other countries, the argument is over integration. In other countries, the argument is on who is coming. Christian talked about selection, perhaps uh, a bit too approvingly about the selection systems of the Canadians, but the fact is that the Canadians select. The United States, for instance, does not select. And here you have a fundamental division, if you will, when it comes to immigration policy, which is who selects? Is it employers? Is it a family? And then you ask the government to come back and ratify the decisions of employers or of families. Or do you have front and center a government that says, I'm in control of this issue. I can take care of my borders. I have a way of allowing certain people in and keeping other people out that has a strategic objective. And I can demonstrate to you that I am meeting at least a large part of that strategic objective. This is the essence of a managed immigration system versus the way that most immigration systems actually work. And most immigration systems work sort of in the absence of government control and guidance. So, if I were to take, you know, considering that I think these anxiety drivers always exist in every immigration system at every time, although they tend to be higher in intensity or lower in, in intensity according to exogenous variables, in other words, what happens outside of immigration, 
how is it that governments ought to be thinking about the topic of today, which in my view, my language, is about how to foster more cohesive societies. In, more plain lang in plainer language, how to build communities that work in which each member plays a role, because when people play a role in building strong communities, people have something at stake. When people have something at stake, they work harder at it. When they don't have anything at stake, they don't work hard at it at all. And I have 10, and now I'm going to ask how much time I have. <laughs> you don't have a, OK. about, uh, ma'am, what did you say? I have nine minutes. Okay, I'll take nine minutes. <laughs> um, I actually have four, but I'll take nights. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's nice to have a decision maker in any group. That's what I've always said. <laughs> and uh, I'll, you know, you can read the paper, so I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna elaborate to, elaborate to any particular degree in any of them, but I will um, say um, at least the titles and a couple of words uh, about it. The first one, and there is, so, uh, there is a hierarchical order of sorts in which I have actually arranged these 10 points. And the hierarchical order comes from experience, which is what is it that governments do least well? Where is it that they fail most frequently? And my number one failure, my favorite failure, that I observe in every government, almost every time, is that they lack in basic listening skills. In other words, they hear, but they don't understand. All too often, concerns of honest people who are concerned, maybe wrong-headed about the concern, but concerns that are legitimate none, none, nonetheless, get marginalized. I always marvel at the way that the Europeans throw epithets at each other, you know. The problem with the Europeans is they think that they understand Greek. So, you know, you have all of these Greek, Greek words, you know, xenophobia and nastiness and all sorts of other things. Nothing can really stop an argument, stop a conversation faster than calling people names. I'm trying to be very plain spoken here. When you call people names, you've lost the argument right at the very beginning. This is a lesson that I've learned from about 30 years worth of sort of wounds in my back, that you don't start a conversation by calling people names. You start a conversation by respect, respectfully listening and then pointing out where the other party may be wrong and then building coalitions that are constructive. And as I said, I'm always struck and I have this conversation so frequently with my friends in Europe. I can tell you I have had zero success with it. So at least it's the most important thing and I have zero success. That tells you something you know, about me perhaps. The second one is you need to engage people in what the future should look like. The future is not something that should be dictated by bureaucrats, by politicians, by eminence crisis, or by anything else like that. It should be one that is developed together with all people in a society. It may take a generation to do so, but if you do so, you're no longer going to have conversations about multiculturalism, integration, or anything like that. Although, that does not mean that politicians will not take license. <laughs> and whenever they feel compelled because they can appeal to a certain part of the electorate, they will say things that they feel that they need to say. The third one is a favorite of mine because I've argued this for about 30 years and now I finally you know, get to the point where everybody gets it. Building a society together, or national identity as I put it here, is more now more than ever about 
becoming rather than being. For too many decades, I heard my colleagues in, my colleagues in, um, in Europe and in Japan, and I actually used to travel to this part of the world and know something about this part of the world, but that was 20 years ago, where everybody would tell me how different they were. Everybody else was the same, you know, the gr in, in you go, whether you go to Greece or Italy or, or France or Japan, the word exceptionalism apparently means something special to them. Well, there is nothing special about exceptionalism except that people like to use this exceptionalism when they want to make a point which is totally useless. This is all about becoming. All of our societies are changing. You have two choices when things are changing. You can come afterwards and ratify them and you lose the game, or you work with them and you manage this change. It's not about being. It's no longer a French is a French is a French. You know, particularly since a French was never a French was never a French. You know, I mean, people tell me in Greece, my, you know, my country of birth, you know, that somehow, you know, they are Greeks. And I try to challenge them to see what the relationship is between modern Greece and the Dorians of two or 3,000 years ago. And the relationship is none. Nor, for that matter, have mo most of these countries had the kind of continuity that many of the countries on this part of the world have enjoyed or have had over the past many hundreds of years. The fourth one is that we ought to be more relaxed about multiple identities. I think that Christian made that point, you know, perhaps not in these, uh, in these words, but holding two or more identities is not a big thing unless politicians decide to make it into a big thing. And so many politicians are tempted, and some of them actually make it into a big thing. The Sarkozy example, of course, is a terrific demonstration of this point. The fifth point is have clear rules about who can come in, how do you gain permanent residence, and how do you gain citizenship and then applying them clearly and fairly. The goal here is predictable outcomes. Make sure that the rules are clear. This way, if people follow the rules, at the end of that particular road, you have outcome X or Y or Z. And you can never go wrong in policy if you do this. The next item is on offering practical, non-punitive integration assistance. All too often, now, far too many Europeans think of integration in punitive terms. Thy, thou shalt integrate or something will happen to you. And by that they mean theoretically, you know, I can strip you of your residency right, I won't allow you to reunite with your family, you have to take the course again and again and pay for it, etc. I think here is one of many places in which government should withdraw, should pull back from, and create incentives for people to do what they know is actually in their best interest. If it is about language, nobody knows better the importance of language for success than families. Not politicians. Families. So if you're going to have policies, you have to have policies that create incentives for people to do the smart thing for themselves and their families. The next point is focus integration efforts on where they matter most. Two places. If I had $10 or whatever the currency would be, I would invest five of that in the workplace and the other five in education. It could very well be seven in education and three at the workplace. But that's it. Now, if I had unlimited dollars, like the Australians, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you don't have unlimited dollars? Thank you. 
then I just spread it around. Uh, but assuming, you know, that you have to do with less. Schools, number one, workplaces. Engage employers. You know, sometimes, all too often, employers seems to be somehow the enemy, you know. Civil society sometimes doesn't like employers because they don't like employers. Um, government, sometimes they don't like employers. They love taxing employers. They don't like employers because they feel that they sort of break the rules. Some countries like employers too much. But the point is that you can work with other actors toward common goals. The eighth point is also something that Christian touched on. In, the, in your language, it's called mainstreaming. And this is a, a, you know, a simple, not so simple term, that says that given limited public resources, should you target these resources, focus these resources on minorities and newcomers, or should you target these resources and set them uh, and focus them on sets of circumstances? In other words, instead of say, this is immigrant integration money, you can say, this is money that uh, is intended to increase, to, to bring about better health outcomes, better employment outcomes, reduce poverty, et cetera, et cetera, among all of the people who actually need these things. And I can guarantee you, among those people will also be immigrants. Don't put a, a target in the back of immigrants and say, you're an immigrant. You're taken away from me. And that is, I think, rather important. Point nine, and I only have 10, so I know I'm boring you, but um, all too often, too many countries feel tempted all the time. Even our friends, the Canadians, did that a few years ago. They feel tempted to try to regulate cultural practices. And my sense is that when it comes to breaking the law or upholding the law, you regulate the hell out of them. In other words, honor killings, no. Abuse, genital mutilation, abuse of children, spouses, etc. sorry. If you don't like it, go to some other place where you can practice these things. But when it comes to more general, generally to cultural practices, religion, you know, how you dress, when you observe, how you observe, etc., what you eat, this should be all left to the population. This is a private sphere issue, and you should leave, get the government out of this private spheres. The final point is the issue of political language and body language. I think that politicians sometimes, or at least too many politicians for a few times, sometimes, think that people are idiots. So when they open up their mouth, they say one thing, but their body language betrays an entirely different thing. What I've learned is that people are not idiots. In fact, nonverbal cues are particularly well developed in populations that always feel targeted. So let's try to align better our language with our body language when it comes to accepting immigrants and creating solid working communities. Thank you very much. Awkward as it may be. And um, open this to uh, comments, questions from the um, from the room. Um, it's all right to make a comment, but if, it is even better if you have a question, and if you address the question to a specific person, otherwise we'll bore you to death and we'll all try to answer the question. I see a hand over there. I don't see a person attached to it. Sir, go ahead. Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Stephen Choi. I am from uh, the United States. 
Uh, this question is actually directed at Professor Hopke. Um, I greatly enjoyed your talk, um, partly because I have significant disagreements with almost all of your contentions. <laughs> uh, but one specific question I had was really related to your policy prescription of selecting the right immigrants. And to me, it seems to be a typical example of an action that would benefit one individual actor or one individual state, but be a completely self-defeating prophecy if every single actor or every state pursued that same policy. It would seem to me that you would cause a tremendous brain drain um, and really a sucking of the best and brightest from the countries that are sending emigrants to many of the, the quote unquote first world countries, which would then precipitate further economic difficulties and then further uh, emigration of the most marginalized and, and the most uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged folks, um, which would in turn then uh, cause more of those kinds of folks, the quote unquote undesirable immigrants to emigrate to those countries. So uh, I just wanted to see what your response would be to that. Um, let's, um, let's take two more. The gentleman over there and I saw a hand back there. So that hand back there. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Bashasha. I'm from Uganda. My question also is for Christian. Uh, on the same point of selecting the right immigrants. Speak closer to the mic. Thank you. Uh, the question is for Christian. Uh, on the selection of the right immigrants. I have just one or two comments on that. Uh, the first one, I wanted you to be clear on the criteria that you use that would be seen to be fair and non-discriminating. Uh, the second point is about how do you handle refugees? Uh, people who have no choice, but they just have to get out of their countries for one reason or another and uh, end up at the borders of, uh, of another country. A uh, related point is, I would think that, especially for Europe, uh, there isn't much choice these days because I think there are economic pressures that might have to uh, force European countries to open up a little bit more, especially looking at the issues of low-skilled labor that you no longer have in Europe, uh, that uh, you might have to suck out or encourage to come in from, uh, from other countries. Finally, uh, there is the colonial legacy of Europe. Uh, I don't know what you have to say about that. Uh, when you shut people out, they tend to think Europe is being unfair uh, for past reasons that uh, probably none of us here is associated with, but which are real. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was one person sort of right. Yeah, you, ma'am. Right behind the gentleman to the right. Sorry. That's it. Hello, I'm Erin Chung. I teach political science at the Johns Hopkins University in the United States. Thank you. Um, Professor Ya's um, lecture really reminded me and I think reinforced the idea that when we talk about diversity as the new problem, we're really glossing over the fact that, um, it's, you know, that, we're, that immigrants are being incorporated into existing social structures, right? And um, given the legacies of colonialism, slavery, anti-Semitism, caste systems, and so forth, Immigrants adapt not only to um, their new socio-cultural environments um, or have to learn new languages, but they also have to learn their place in existing social hierarchies that may be based on race, ethnicity, uh, class, gender, and so forth. Um, and so in this way, you know, I think we need to think about what are the existing social hierarchies that shape the kinds of political mobilization that we see um, among immigrants. And so I have two questions. Um, one is um, sort of alluding to um, a comment that um, Toni Morrison, an American author, once made. She said that kind of the ultimate sign of assimilation for immigrants is anti-black racism. So once they understand and kind of assimilate anti-black racism, is the process complete? Um, so first for Professor Ya, um, you mentioned that um, the new pluralism in Singapore it, is reinforcing the conjunction of race uh, with class, um, which suggests that the new foreign workers are probably at the bottom of multiracialism um, in Singapore, and at the same time, they're also made invisible because they don't exist um, in any of the um, uh, uh, kind of officially recognized social hierarchies or, of multiracialism. So I wonder, uh, just more generally, how has this shaped racial politics um, in Singapore? And um, more specifically, um, do you see any evidence of cross-national 
cross ethnic or cross racial alliances as well as animosities, uh, especially between um, cit Singaporean citizen groups um, and um, new foreign workers um, that are also consisting of different ethnicities. And then quickly for Professor um, Yopke, I think the, um, the, your point that religion um, is inherently exclusive kind, kind of assumes a static view of religion. Um, because as we know, religion is not merely a set of beliefs among individuals and groups or merely a set of identities, but it can be a very important non-state institution that can be a source for incorporation, collaboration, empowerment uh, for immigrant communities across religions themselves, especially when states don't have these kind of formally recognized incorporation pro programs or policies. Um, so the question I have for you, um, which I was curious because you didn't mention, is to what extent have European Jews um, sort of set the blueprint for making claims to the state as well as seeking political empowerment and for, in this case, um, immigrants and their descendants? Thank you. Um, I'll stop at three. We'll sort of have a conversation and then I'll take three more. Um, so Christian, why don't you take the the selection issue first, then Brenda, you can have your question about Singapore, and then Christian, you come back, we'll give you a break, catch your breath, and you can address yourself to the issues of uh, you know, the last point that was made here. Can you turn it on? As I was too long already, I will be very brief on that, even though um, that is a very important point with um, select the right immigrants, which is, of course, provocatively formulated, if you want. Um, and indeed, if uh, every country selects the right immigrants, which today is clearly a preference for the highly skilled, you will have uh, the inevitable result of uh, having no educated people in Africa, in certain parts of Asia, uh, where a lot of immigrants are uh, coming from uh, in the West. Um, so select the right immigrants can only be an advice, say, if a Canadian says, um, you Europeans, you are too um, control-minded in your uh, civic integration policy, then my response would be, uh, one way out of that is uh, to choose as the Canadians choose. Um, so uh, if the perspective is uh, of how to change the emphasis in integration policy from, from a nasty control intention to a more beneficial service and help the immigrants in the adjustment process intention, then uh, there cannot be other, any other, uh, or th then the main line uh, to achieve that would be to select uh, more on the basis of skills and say, let with, even though you cannot even then say, in turn you have to select less on the basis of family and on the basis of asylum seeking because these are as of rights migrants. I mean, liberal Western constitutional states have to accept family migrants because they protect the family. Uh, the family is the unit of uh, uh, also Western society, of all uh, human society if you want. And uh, Western states have to live up by their international obligations uh, under, under international refugee law. Therefore, you, 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 uh, you can restrict asylum seeking to a degree, but you cannot, of course, um, circumvent uh, your interna international law and your own constitutional law uh, obligations. So, with respect to selecting, it's a complex story. My, my thing in mind was really uh, President Sarkozy's logo at the time to shift from, as he called it, from suffered migration to chosen migration. That, for him, was the big imperative. And that somehow summarized a certain uh, thinking among political elites. Of course, Sarkozy completely failed in that enterprise. And uh, luckily he failed because you cannot make it a quid pro quo, as it were, turn off the wolf of family and asylum and then turn on the wolf uh, uh, of or the channel of, uh, of, of uh, high-skilled uh, uh, people simply because you would no longer... Uh, <laughs> um, you would no longer be in a, in a constitutional state if you did that because you cannot trample on people's rights. The colonial legacy of Europe, um, look, 
that has been um, observed. Uh, if the majority of immigrants to Britain today come from uh, Jamaica, from Southeast Asia, from India, then because of uh, a commonwealth privilege that initially these people could migrate freely to the, uh, to the motherland. If the majority of immigrants in France is North African, then not by accident, because uh, this is the colonial uh, uh, reference for, for, for the French. So colonialism actually is the reason why certain people move to Belgium rather than to England and, and, and so forth. Germany is an exception here. They didn't have colonies uh, for a long while, therefore uh, they have uh, uh, guest worker immigrants on the basis of bilateral agreements. So the colonial legacy was observed. I don't think you can, you can reproach the Europeans for, for being bad on that angle. And what you face today is, is a new reality. You could call it super diversity. You have an incredible increase of the origin countries of uh, migrants, which you can no longer at all conceive of in terms of uh, former colonial ties and, and linkages. Um, and Europe is exposed to super diversity much like any other Western state. So I don't see a particular uh, colonial uh, obligation of European states and to the degree that they had one, I think it has been <coughs> not intentionally really, but de facto observed. Right. Uh, remember all of these questions we're gonna come back to again and again and again over the next 48 hours. So this isn't this is not going to be the last word, so we can keep our, our answers, if you don't mind, you know, very brief. This way we can take many more questions. Brenda. Thank you for that comment on um, the various kinds of hierarchies of class, race, gender, and how that shapes the new pluralism in places like Singapore. Uh, I'll just sort of briefly answer by um, maybe itemizing it in, in terms of four points. Um, how has this shaped, how has migration shaped the, the, the racial politics in, in Singapore today, I think was the question. I think the first point to make is that um, in terms of so-called racial politics, it's really gone beyond the CMIO model. I mean, uh, CMIO is um, the fixed categories attaching ancestral cultures that is be beginning to fray, I think, uh, at the edges at least. Um, that's one. Two would be that um, within each category, uh, whether it's Chinese, Malay, Indian, uh, there are also sort of intra-race kinds of politics. It doesn't mean that the PRC Chinese who come to Singapore would naturally sort of gravitate towards Chinese Singaporeans and uh, find sort of commonality there. There are also sort of the politics of sameness as opposed to difference and that can get quite entangled uh, as well. So um, that's the that's second, give, give you examples uh, in the break if you like. Um, the third is to say that um, in terms of the uh, low-skilled treaty uh, labor migrants, they remain very much um, excluded out of um, Singapore policy and, and remain very much at the very bottom of uh, the hierarchy, largely as uh, disposable labor. I think one of the differences with uh, Western models is that in, in Singapore and in many Asian countries, migration is of the temporary nature, circular migration is what's encouraged. And um, it's a rotating door approach that's used uh, in Singapore and other places, uh, keeping labor sort of uh, as disposable labor. And the uh, consideration there is that uh, these, uh, these, these individuals would then return back to their countries, I mean, uh, and not remain and, and not root in uh, Singapore society. So in that sense, while there are very large numbers of, uh, say, uh, Bangladeshi workers, uh, Filipino workers, Indonesian workers, uh, they often left out the whole question of racial politics because the assumption uh, rightly or wrongly, is that they would return and not remain in the uh, polity. Um, and my fourth and last point would be to say that uh, that's a different issue with marriage migrants, because marriage migrants come right into the, the very heart of the family. And uh, there, I would like to sort of be a bit more optimistic, because uh, I, be I do see that problems and issues with marriage migrants and their so-called integration into families today. I believe that in a time would 
basically be the solution here in terms of uh, as their children sort of move into Singapore schools, uh, do national service and so forth, um, I think the, um, the, these, the new generations will, through these various efforts, uh, become very much more integrated with, with the generations to come. Maybe that's an optimism that I may, should not have. Yeah. I think to have some optimism about things, okay? It's the first day. We don't need to be depressed until Sunday. <laughs> Christian, the last question. Quickly, please. The religion question. Um, if I said that religion uh, by nature is exclusive, that in general you can only adhere to one God and not to two at the same time, that doesn't mean that religion cannot be a source for integration. In the, in, in the immigration context. It depends, it depends. Uh, there's a great article by Nancy Fona and Richard Alba. Uh, they compare Europe and America. In Europe, uh, religion is a source um, for integration. In, uh, in America and in Europe, uh, religion is a barrier to integration. I think that is generally correct. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that uh, European societies are secular societies and have a problem with facing fiercely religious people, to put it colloquially. And secondly, in a way, uh, a big proportion of immigrants to Europe are indeed Islamic and not uh, Christian. And I do think uh, that creates a special problems with respect to considering the Islamic re uh, religion a source rather than a barrier uh, for integration. The Jews, however, are an interesting story here because Islamic integration in Europe uh, functions very well whenever there is a Jewish precedence. For example, ritual slaughter. Generally, no problem has been acknowledged. There are exemptions from uh, animal cruelty laws uh, wherever there has been a precedent under European legislations uh, for Jews already established. Then, of course, on the principle of equality, you cannot deny the same exemption, the same privilege to Jewish people. And conversely, wherever there is no Jewish precedent, dress codes, free speech issues, also uh, gender issues, equality of women, wherever there is no Jewish precedence, you have not smooth sailing, you have rough sailings for Muslims. Thank you. Let me put a, and I'll take three questions. Let me try to put an item for discussion in the next two days because these questions that we had, I think, go to the very heart of what is it that an immigration system is intended to reflect and in which balance. Some of the questions came from a perspective that suggests that, you know, that we should be doing one thing rather than the other thing. The question is, if we're going to do one thing plus another thing plus a third thing, what should the balance be? If it's supposed to reflect the values of a nation and meet a nation's legal responsibilities and meet a nation's need for economic growth and competitiveness, and I've just given you the three streams through which all immigration comes, what should the balance be among those three? And if you have to work within a zero sum, where you have a set number of visas that you want to make available, how do you configure within that sum and meet all three of these priorities of an immigration system? And we have on the one hand the Australians that probably point, test, or in a sense select 30, 35%. You'll tell us what the number is. The Canadians that select about 27% of their immigrants this year, typically around 25 or so, but they want to push it up. But in the case of the, Austra of the Canadians, they never reduced either their refugee intake or their family. So how do you do this is a basic decision that every, every immigration policymaker has to make. Three questions, please. Ma'am. Hello. Yes, I'm Imelda Nicolás from the Philippines. Uh, two very quick questions. One is the most recent backlash against migration and multiculturalism 
is of course, as mentioned by Professor uh, Christian, is due to language and culture. But uh, don't you think the current economic situation in receiving countries is also an important factor in this backlash? Number two, what is the role of media, both traditional and social media, in the multiculturalism in their respective countries? Um, are they ahead of the general public in terms of multiculturalism, of pushing multiculturalism, or do they just reflect what the general public is thinking? Thank you. So Thank any you. one or all of them? Thank you. I'll take one from this side of the room because I've been... This side of the room has no questions. They have been persuaded. No, you cannot ask a second question. <laughs> Back there. Hi, I'm Julia Jinkia from the Center for American Progress in the United States. Uh, my question is also for Professor Yupke. Um, specifically to your point at the end about respecting the majority culture. And I'm curious, you know, at what point we have to actually allow multicultural societies and newcomers to reconstitute the national identity and in fact even the majority culture. Because I understand, you know, the U.S. is in a unique position, but we're moving closer and closer to a day where we will have actually no racial or ethnic majority. In 2042, actually, whites are supposed to become our national minority. So, you know, I'm curious at what point we have to, for a more genuine understanding of multiculturalism, move beyond the sort of superficial plurality um, and, you know, one that would give some sort of false permanence to this majority culture and allow newcomers to actually be part of the new social fabric. And I think talking to Professor Yeo's point about what goes on in Singapore, this really problematizes the hyphenated identity. You know, I think on a level of personal politics, when someone asks me to identify myself, I make it a point to always identify as American and not Asian American, not Indian American, because I think that gives a sense of falseness to what the actual American looks like and necessarily says it's someone who doesn't look like me. Okay, do I have one more? All the way back there, whoever it is. Speak very close to the microphone, please. Okay, my name is Tove Livendal and I come from Sweden, working at the independent think tank there. And I have a question for you, uh, Mr. Papa Dimitriou, about, uh, I agree very much upon trying to have a restriction when it comes to legis legislating about cultural practices, but then I would al ask you, where you would consider school and workplaces to be? Would you put them in the private sphere or in the public sphere? All right, so um, why don't we go with you, Brenda, first, and then Christian, and then I will go, and that will be it. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, in terms of the Imelda's question about economic conditions, that obviously fe features, I uh, think, very strongly in all contexts, um, especially when it comes to labor migrants. I mean, um, the, in, in Singapore, the, 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 the government line is that the uh, uh, foreigners, labor migrants, skilled and unskilled, basically help, help us grow the economic pie. And that can then mean a uh, trickle down of um, sort of eco economic benefits for all. So that will work if there is growth. Um, but uh, and then um, you would see that uh, migrants basically get, get an easier time because that that particular argument can hold. But once the um, economic pie is no longer growing or it's is shrinking, then I think the uh, issues would become much more intense. Um, the second question about media, definitely in terms of social media in particular, that has, uh, I think, had the role of uh, magnifying many of the issues. I mean, social media tends to uh, like to uh, link on to what's hot and what's sensational, so that with, on both sides of the coin, whether it's sort of anti-immigrants or, or for uh, sort of immigrants, uh, it tends to magnify, I think, um, the, the noise level for these issues. And sometimes it does cloud uh, the kinds of conversations and dialogue that we, we might have. Uh, definitely a major, major player. Uh, and just a comment on um, the uh, question of hyphenated identities. Um, definitely agree with you that uh, the way to go one day would be uh, a mo much more cosmopolitan world where um, race becomes uh, less of a marker. It is probably a, a 
pro processual thing. I mean, uh, in Singapore, definitely you can't do away with race straight away. I mean, uh, given our kind of colonial history as well as uh, nation building philosophy, which is very much based on trying to uh, have an even handed kind of racialism where uh, even the majority Chinese race is seen as one category as opposed to the majority category. I mean, uh, so. Um, racial politics will have to evolve, and um, for now, I think um, hyphenation is actually a way forward. I mean, it may not uh, lead to the kinds of progressive politics that uh, one hopes for um, in the ultimate, but it's, to me, it's a way forward out of uh, the very fixed, the, the, the situation of very fixed categories. And um, yeah, maybe uh, it requires sort of uh, nation states to come together uh, as one world before we uh, get to the stage of cosmopolitan rather than multiracial uh, identities, yeah. One world. Okay, Christian. The retreat of uh, multiculturalism, indeed in my uh, uh, view, uh, in Europe has to do a lot with uh, problems surrounding uh, Islam and Muslims. Um, and I would not make economics uh, the center of this uh, debate, if you call it that. Um, and the simple affirmation of that view, that it's not about, all about economics, is that this retreat really uh, precedes uh, the financial crisis. If that is your uh, candidate for economics here, the financial crisis is much younger than the uh, multiculturalism in retreat discussion in Germany, even though the examples I gave indeed are quite uh, recent. With respect to majority culture, respect majority culture, that is a very delicate, prickly issues, issue, and I cannot um, give you a good answer to that, but I would flag that there are two considerations that have to be part and parcel of a good answer, a good approach to how to deal with that issue. On the one side, States, liberal states, should not unnecessarily dwell on issues of culture and identity. Leave that to the marketplace of ideas and don't make it the subject of state policy. Secondly, however, still the best maxim or logo for integration which has been completely um, obscured and ignored under the predominance of multicultural reasoning is when in Rome, do as do. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the Greeks do, so <laughs> I just finished your sentence. <laughs> so um, I, I'm already four minutes over my limit, so I will be monosyllabic in my answer. Uh, or at least close to monosyllabic. Schools and workplaces fall in between public and private. And the decisions, of course, on that should be made by educators, by people who have the best interest of the child in mind, rather than the heavy hand of government. And there are revolutions that are going on in education in most advanced industrial societies that if we were in education, uh, group here, you know, or if we had someone from the education um, uh, field, it would make all of our heads spin. Uh, but coming from Sweden, you know, I also recognize that government leads and government does, and everybody else sort of falls into place. I can't resist making a comment to the comment from my colleague from, uh, um, from the United States. Um, I think it's not about allowing or prescribing. Best, when things work best, when they work organically. So, you know, leave the state out of conversations about multiculturalism and hyphenation and things like that. This can be interesting academic arguments, arguments between activists, etc., etc. Organic change is change that lasts. I thank you. First of all, for your patience, all of you. I'd like to thank my two co-panelists for terrific, uh, terrific presentations and terrific answers. 
we gave you a lot to think about. We got you excited. I didn't see anyone falling asleep, which means that we've met the minimum requirements for the job. Now, I'm, sub I'm sure that there is something that we're supposed to be doing now, but for the life of me, I don't know what it is. Can someone help? Someone is helping. Please take over. Thank you.